pleasure to talk with Jim Schultz, the the Dr. Jim at Tasty Trade, and usually he's on at 2 Eastern at uh, Tasty Trade with longtime friend uh, Tom Sosnoff, uh, the incomparable Tom Sosnoff, <laughs> and uh, always fun talking to Tom and catching up. And so Jim has been, uh, how long you been with Tom and, and everybody? Yeah, it's been eight and a half years now. Like I can't wow. believe it. It's yeah, eight and a half uh, years. Time time flies. Yeah, it was. Uh, so eight, Jim. Why don't you give a quick, maybe a quick rundown of where'd you go to college? Would you get a doc? How did that happen? That you ended up in a place called Tasty Trade, and how did that journey? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I'm originally from Detroit. You know, grew up right on the east side of Detroit, and my parents still live in the house I grew up in, and so very yeah. middle class family. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, it was great. You know, it, it was it was amazing. But then I went to undergrad at Central Michigan University. So fire up chips for anyone that might be familiar <laughs> with the area. Uh, undergrad, I did my undergrad and my MBA at Central Michigan, and then, you know, I really thought I wanted to be a stockbroker for most of my undergraduate. Uh, yeah. degree. But then I worked an internship at one of the big uh, brokerage firms, uh, Raymond James and Associates. Everybody oh, knows sure. Raymond James. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it was amazing. It was terrific. Right? I loved it. It was great. Got along with my manager, whatever. They said, hey, just go graduate. You got a job, all those kinds of things. The things that yes. the, the, the thing that didn't really appeal to me about that position was it wasn't really it really had nothing to do with finance. It had everything to do with people skills, relationships, you know, yeah. salesmanship, sure. et cetera. So I didn't love that. So anyway, decided to go forward for my PhD and, you know, kind of, you know, uh, follow a trajectory into academia. Yeah. So that's how I went down to the University of Memphis for my graduate work. And uh, I, did, I started in 2005 and I finished in 2009 from the University of Memphis. And uh, I left you Memphis. Get the with, which would you get the degree with? Uh, I mean, it was in finance. finance. I got a, a P, yeah, PhD with a finance uh, concentration. And I actually, I had a, a micro, uh, well, I, an economics minor, if you will. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so graduated, left Memphis with my degree. Uh, I also met my wife in Memphis, you know, classic okay. Southern belle. And so <laughs> we got married in 2009, have three beautiful kids. I took my first job in, at a small university in South Carolina and I was teaching there. I thought I would teach my whole career. Well, university. Then, uh, Winthrop University. Oh, wow. And then, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in 2015, I, I met Tom and I was like, wow, man, like he's really, I mean, anyone who might be familiar with, you know, academia, uh, you know, and Dan, I think you're, you're quite familiar with academia, if I'm not mistaken. And so well, it's. No, I just have a, I just have a four year degree from DePaul, but no, I, I, oh. I, I don't have any major. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, it's, I mean, you know, the curriculums and like the things they're doing in academia, but they're way behind the times, man, like mm -hmm. way behind. And it was very frustrating for me. Whereas yeah. Tom, you know, even then, especially now on the cutting edge, looking to innovate, looking to push the envelope, et cetera. So yeah. I got, to, I, you know, so I met him, we got to know each other, blah, 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 blah. He's like, Hey, come to Chicago. I got a spot for you. I'll give you your own show and it, it'll be great. And I said, ah, man, I don't know. But then finally, I was like, "Hey, let's do it." And autumn was all autumn was all in. I was all in, and then the yeah. rest is history. And so now here yeah. I am, eight and a half years later. Yeah, but you 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 got yourself back from was it was it you were telling me a little bit because of COVID, you were able to escape. COVID allowed you to escape <laughs> Chicago and get back out to Tampa, right? Oh, what yeah. a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah. Escape is the perfect word to use, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean that just to escape the winters, man. Like you That's know, what I mean, oh, I mean yeah. it's eight months. No, it's eight months. Don't yeah. ever let anyone tell you differently. Oh, yeah. Like it starts in September and they push it all the way to May. No right. question. Spring, spring is more of a thought than a reality. Spring <laughs> doesn't, you know, to say something's, you know, it's really May, you know, May to September, you have some relief and that's about yeah. it. That's so, it. That's, that's it. Yeah. So here well, we good. are. Good to have you. And, and folks, I think Jim was going to today, uh, we'll discuss a little bit. He was going to talk, I think, butterflies. Is that correct? That's correct. Which is a big, 
I mean, in, in our community, if, if you said to me, what's the number one strategy that folk have been, I mean, they do a lot, but the number one strategy folk have been doing the last 10, 15 years, I'd say the butterfly. In, 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 in different flavors or versions, there's many. I think the most popular favorite, just because, you know, most of the last 10, 15 years, the market's gone up. So some type of a broken wing butterfly with much less risk on the upside. So that's been more palatable. But, you know, it's like, as, as I tell people, it's like if you take 30 pounds of weight off your stomach and stick it on your behind, you know, you look a lot better from the front, but you still have the, excuse the bad analogy, Jim's looking at me trying to take me serious, but, but I, you know, it's still there. And it's like, on a broken wing butterfly, if you take the risk away from the upside and it looks beautiful, it's got to go somewhere and it goes to the downside. And now it's not been a reality for most of the last 10 years, you know, in terms of amount of time, but it's still a real risk. And but I think people have pushed the envelope with at least what I've seen with butterflies to try to make it palatable with an upward trending uh, market. So um uh, with, with that said, I'd like to see, always love to hear different people talk different strategies. Uh, I, I love to pick up ideas. So I, I appreciate you coming on here and 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 throwing uh, butterflies uh, at us as uh, as the market's up. Again, I mean, the you know, what's the saying, Jim? The, the market can stay uh, irrational longer than we can stay solvent. And you know, how many people, especially with all of, you know, anybody from the trading pits has, has a bit of contrarian in them. And I know Tom is probably at the top of that, uh, of the contrarian club, right? And it just gets tiring, right? Okay, it goes up, sell, goes up, sell. I mean, it's, uh, and, and, you know, you just have to take what the market gives you. Right. Because it's, you know, we, you know, many people have been saying we need to back off for how many years and it just keeps going. So anyways, well, Jim, share whatever's on your your uh, your heart here as far as uh, uh, butterflies. And if we'll, we'll just, you know, if anybody's got questions, you can throw them in there. And whenever Jim gets a chance, he can uh, answer them. And I may as have some questions, too, just because interest in the whole thing and. So Jim, go ahead. Yeah, sure. No, that sounds great. And I'm absolutely, that was a great analogy. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to use that later that's on my right. show later today. No, it's great. No, come on, that's, man. That was excellent. Yeah. And, and the other thing is just that I think it's good since you'll be on Tasty Trade, a lot of our folk, and, and, and this will be recorded, a lot of our folk, you know, just to see you maneuvering around a Tasty Trade is a help also, because uh, most of them have been starting with, really with, Tom and so I, I think or swim. And so, but tasty trade is a very good brokerage platform and Jim will be tooling around on that today. So thanks. Yeah, no, I'm going to hop in. I'm going to hop in right now. No, definitely. And as and the, the way I typically like to do these things, uh, I'll probably talk for, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 yeah. minutes. I've got one thing I want to talk about, but then let's spend 15, 20 minutes and let's do some sure. Q and a. So if anybody has sure. any questions, so oh, toss them in the chat right now. Yeah, toss them in the chat, and you know, I'll, I'll probably save them for the end, sure. and then we'll just kind of we'll go from there. But I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of talk about a strategy. Sure. If your community is familiar with butterflies, sure, they, they might be already familiar with this. But I have a couple in my portfolio right now, yeah. So I think it's gonna be a great a great way for us to sure. for us to do this. So yeah. let me go ahead and uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. Let me see. Uh, man, I haven't been on Zoom in a while. But uh, let's see. Let's yeah, do that. that. Shares, and the bottom, that green but share screen. Oh yeah, we yeah. See you it. got. Can you? You should see Perfect. it. You can see it now, Perfect. right? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me go ahead and. Uh, yeah. Let me let me size this up a little bit. And uh, all right. Yeah. So this is the uh, from theory to practice portfolio that I talk about every day uh, on my show at two o'clock. And so if you were to tune in later today, you're going to see the same portfolio. But what okay. I want to talk about today. I want to talk about expected move butterflies. So this is a really, really interesting strategy where you can play it to the upside. You can play it to the downside. This is going to be mostly suited for 
you know, directional moves where you either want to play it up or down. You could play it neutral, but it's not really designed for that. But also it's going to give, you know, your community a way to play kind of like binary events or news events or maybe like an earnings announcement or something like that with only a fraction of the risk with some pretty significant upside potential in the strategy. Like you talked about broken wing butterflies playing the market to the upside. That's more of like a, you know, at least the way I look at it, it's more of a longer term strategy, something you can kind of rinse and repeat over time. Yeah. I'm going to show your, your community something that it's kind of more like a, it's kind of more like a sniper shot. It's kind of more <laughs> like a, Hey, I see this opportunity, whether it be CPI, whether it be, you know, uh, Apple earnings, whatever. And I kind of want to play it, but I don't want to have a ton of risk in the trade. This is going to be an opportunity uh, for your community to do that. And I have a couple that I put on just yesterday. It's going to be this uh, this GC position right here and then this SPX position right there. I'll even grab my uh, – oh, nice. Yeah, the drawing tools on Zoom are nice. So you've yeah. got this guy right here, and then you've got this guy right here. And So we'll, we'll actually circle back and talk about those two because they're about to expire today, of course. And uh, I just want to make mention of these because those were both expected move butterflies that I put on on my show yesterday. And so it's a perfect uh, dovetail with what we're doing now. So, all right. So let's say, you know, let's say you wanted to do, you know, you can do these in the broad market indexes. I think you mentioned to me when we were kind of setting up for this, that most of your community trades indexes. Is that right? Yes. A, a lot of okay. S a lot of SPX. Yeah, a lot of SPX. Okay, so perfect. So this strategy, you can absolutely use this in SPX. And the nice thing about SPX, as you guys know, is it's cash settles. So you don't have to worry about, you know, waking up with, you know, X amount of shares of SPX. You know, it's just not going to be a, a, a concern. So let's say that you wanted to do an expected move. Let's say you wanted to do some kind of play for Monday. So this is a very short-term play. You want to do it just over the weekend. Like you think, you know, this rally is going to continue. And it's got legs and what happened yesterday is just a one-off and just all those different things. Well, I mean, what happened yesterday in S&P 500 and NASDAQ? Now, the Russell has just been on an absolute tear, complete runaway train up another 31 today. So who knows? Who knows what's going on? Yeah. So anyway, you go into Monday. So let's say we go into this July cycle, this July 15th cycle with three days to go. That's obviously going to be a Monday expiration. Yeah. And if I open this guy up, you know, you're going to see inside a tasty trade. And again, I don't know what your community might may or may not be familiar with. This could be super easy for them. They might be familiar with all this, or it could be brand new. If you look inside a tasty trade, you've got this copper strip that's in the center of the screen. Yeah. That shows you the expected move for whatever cycle you're looking at. So three days to go, you know, this is going to tell you that, all right, you know, the expected move visually is SPX down to, you know, 56, so seven, it looks like or maybe up to 56.62. Like there is the anticipated range as of right now. You can actually look at that number up here too. In the upper right-hand corner, it's going to be plus or minus $27. So that's kind of a visual representation of the expected move, and that's kind of a numerical representation of the expected move. Okay. Well, if let's say you wanted to play. Now, you could do it either way, upside or downside. It doesn't really matter. But this gives you a nice statistical framework for what the market is expecting the anticipated range of SPX to be. So you could go in here and you could say, all right, well, I'm going to play for another upside move, some continuation into Monday. And I'm going to do, you know, maybe I set up like a $20 wide butterfly in SPX, which is not super wide because it's a $5,600 product. And so you probably don't want to do super, super tight because those can be really, really difficult to make money with. But you can do, you know, like a 56, let's say 56.45, 56.65, 56.85. And then, of course, I double up on the guts there. And so I'm looking at a $20 wide butterfly, this guy right here. And I'm only paying $3.60 for it. And so when I look at my maximum loss, of course, it's only going to be the debit that I pay. This is a standard butterfly. We're not breaking wings. We're not breaking hearts. We're not doing anything like that. We're just keeping a real, real plain vanilla. But if you look at the maximum profit potential, it's like 1600 bucks. And so let's talk about that for a minute. Let's say that SPX goes down and you're completely wrong, which from time to time, I don't know about you, Dan, but it happens to me. Oh, from time to time, than, I'm wrong. Me, me more than most, but go ahead. <laughs> Here, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I might have you beat on that one. Well, let's say SPX gives it all up on Monday. Now we're back to, you know, 5600 or 5580, whatever. 
you're only going to lose the 360. You're only going to lose the debit that you pay. And again, yeah. as a, a community that trades butterflies often, I would assume that most of your, your traders inside this community are very comfortable with that. But yeah. if you look at the maximum profit potential, it's like, man, I could potentially make, now this is mostly just a theoretical number. We're going to talk about that in a second. But my maximum profit potential, 1600 bucks. So when you start thinking about a risk return trade-off, this is a really nice way to take some directional bet in a very, very short-term trade in a specific product for kind of a specific time frame. Now, I don't think there are any really heavy newsworthy things coming out on Monday. So Monday may not be the best example of this, but since it's short term, you know, and I kind of wanted to look at something more or less overnight, I kind of wanted to bring up something that's really, really uh, close in duration and close in expiration. When you think about the maximum profit potential, you know, you kind of want to think about, all right, I'm not going to cash in the full max profit, right? Because to do that, you would need to pin the short strike and carry it all the way to expiration. In mm -hmm. fact, I mean, we're going to look at my SPX butterfly. I've basically pinned the short strike on that right now. Right. The short strike on that butterfly is 5630. You've got right. the market at 5635. And so we're right. basically right there and you're going to see, and it's set to expire today. I'm not, I'm not anywhere near max profit on that trade. And right. so you have to think about it in terms of, all right, what is a reasonable amount, right? What is a reasonable amount for me to target on this trade? I mean, personally, when I do an expected meal butterfly, if I'm able to make, you know, 1X, 1.5X, 2X, 2.5X of my debit paid, that is a phenomenal trade in my opinion. Yeah. That is a terrific trade in my opinion. So just to give your traders some type of, you know, some type of, you know, uh, landmark in terms of what to expect and some kind of reference point. I think that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable starting, uh, starting point. Now, if I erase these, let's actually go to my XPX butterfly. Just, to, I'm going to show you guys, this is so cool that it's happening right now because yeah. you can see for yourself, this is a 20, this is actually a $25 wide butterfly. Yeah. Look at that short strike 5630. Yeah. Look at the stock 5632. 5633. Yeah. And look at the mark price. It's nowhere near 25. It's not even half of 25. That's crazy. Right, right. Like, that's really crazy, right? It's like, man, yeah. I would expect this to be a lot closer to 25. Maybe not 20 or 18, but I would have expected at least 14 or 15 or 16. Yeah. But man, we are just not there because these butterflies, they cling to extrinsic value until the very end. Because you got to remember. If you pin that short strike, you have to remember what's actually happening, right? The yeah. market moves to your short strike. That's what you want. But those are the short options in the strategy. They're going to fill up with extrinsic value. The extrinsic value is going to increase in those options. And the only way to achieve max profit or near max profit is you need that extrinsic value to dissipate. You need that extrinsic value to go away. And so because, you know, we've pinned the short strike, it's kind of a gimme gotcha type of thing. It's kind of like a pros and cons type of thing. It's like, all right, this is exactly where I need the stock to be, but not right now. I need it to be here at 315, not 1115. Right. And so that's why, you know, these strategies, when you look at a max profit number, you know, it's good as a reference point. It's good to kind of have some idea of risk and return, but it's not going to be something that you can realistically achieve. Yeah. And then, and then the next thing I want to make sure that I say is when it comes to, you know, the directional moves in a stock, I have just found that, you know, generally speaking, you know, the expected moves are really, really good at giving you some idea of where the stock is likely headed if it moves in that direction. Now, again, obviously, this is not a foolproof strategy. This is not the holy grail that you guys are used to, you know, getting from Dan here on a regular basis. And so my apologies for not giving you the lock, stock, and barrel system <laughs> that I know that he has for you. But hopefully this is a tool. This is a tool that you can think about, right? Yeah. And so I've just found the expect gives you, you know, rather than just kind of like, you know, just, just reaching in the dark or I think this is even like way better than like a chart or way better than like some type of pattern recognition because it's given you a probability based foundation you know, based on the implied volatility in the marketplace right now of what the magnitude of the move is likely to be. Now, again, you know, if, if, if your community has never traded these before, you know, this is not going to be some panacea. This is not going to be some thing that's always going to work. You're going to learn. It's actually as evidenced by the SPX trade. I mean, look at this again, 
It's like I nailed the direction. I even nailed the magnitude. And I'm only up, what, uh, 3x? Not even, like, 2.5x? So this is an amazing trade. Don't get me wrong. I'm not upset. But again, in terms of what you might expect out of this, it's just not there. And yeah. so it's like, all right, you just have to make sure that you apply, you know, the proper filters and the proper expectations. Yeah. No, Jim, your perspective is fantastic. We've traded these for years. We call it a, I've called this for years, a time bomb butterfly. A lot of people in the pits would trade these butterflies because they're really cheap and you could kind of, uh, they would use this as maybe a tool to get into a trade, but I like them, but I, I, you know, what you said, you know, much of what you said really stands out. But what, one of the comments you said is, you know, you look how much time people spend on charts, right? And, and this is better because it's real. It's real based on implied volatility. And if you place it at, you know, an expected move fly, uh, it's, it's, it's a cheap shot. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's much, to me, it's, it's much more reasonable than, buying a call if I'm bullish or even buying a call vertical debit spread. This is as cheap of a shot, but it's going to be a much better yield than a long call or a call vertical spread. I mean, the the, the negatives are you got to get the timing right. I mean, you, you couldn't have been more, you hit the bullseye. Whereas if I would have done this trade, you know, at this strike, you know, two weeks out, I'd be at the, I might short strike, but I'd like, you know, the old Wendy's commercial years ago, where's the beef? I'd say, hey, where's the money? But here, because it hit it that day, I mean, you're up, what, 200% right now or more? I mean, if I, if I paid 380 and you if can I see I'm up, I'm up 750, I'm up yeah. about almost, almost that two and a quarter. So 2.25x, yeah, almost two and a half X. Um, and you did that. Yeah. And, and again, I, I mean, I just use this when I put this trade on. I just, I just did exactly what I just showed everybody. Just, I mean, yeah. I didn't like, this is no matter. Like I just looked at the expected move and I just played it to the upside yesterday. You can go now, back and check you, the tapes. Jim, what was in your mind? Um, not that, I mean, and I think that's the lesson, the expected move. They're very effective. What made you pick the upside versus the downside? And I can't share that with your community for free. <laughs> like that's going to, that's going to take three easy payments of thirty nine ninety five if you want that information. <laughs> No, I said, no, I just, I felt, well, yesterday was so, yesterday, yesterday was, was so, was great, so yesterday was, was so great. odd because you had a strong inflation print, right? I mean, as made up as those numbers are, which sure. they clearly are, right. it, it's still, the market's looking at that, right? And the Fed's looking at that and whatever. So you had a made up inflation or you had a, you had a, a soft inflation print and then you had ES and NQ just getting obliterated. Right. But gold and the Russell were running away like inflation was right. over. And so yeah. I was like, all right, it would not surprise me. Again, it was just a hunch. But I was yeah. like, it would not surprise me if this trade completely reverses tomorrow. Now, again, I mean, I guess I was right when it comes to ES and NQ, but not really because Russell is still a runaway train to the upside. And so hmm. that that was my thinking. I was just thinking, you know, the market really likes to you know, just lead you to believe X is going to happen and then kind of pull the rug out from underneath you, as of course, you know, quite well. And so yeah. it was just a hunch. It really was just a hunch. And again, that's what's great about the strategy as you know, with the time bomb butterflies, you guys know this, you have yeah. a hunch, there's not a ton of skin in the game, but there's a little bit. And it's like, if you nail it, it can be a nice thing to offset what you might do on a normal basis. Well, and the yield, like you said, the yield is on a $300 investment, whatever you did, you're up seven, $800. So, I mean, it's, 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 uh, yeah, uh, we have, yeah, you know, uh, I had a, I'm going to hold this question we had, um, from somebody, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, that's great. I mean, that was the main thing I want to talk about from a butterfly standpoint. There actually is one other thing that I want to talk about. Yeah. Do, do, do you guys trade, um, futures or futures options at all? Not, I mean, there's some students who will trade those. I haven't. So I would appreciate anything on, on futures options. I know that's, that's, Folk do more. Yeah. Some of the, yeah, folk well, do. I'm just gonna, I, I want to pop in there for like five or eight minutes only because be I, I, if I'm, if I'm, I'm assuming, and I'm guessing that there are a number of your students, number of the traders in the community that are trading in their IRAs. Is that, is that oh, fair? Absolutely. 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 Okay. So, okay. So this is going to be, so this is going to be a complete game changer 
for okay. the traders that are using an IRA account. It's going to help people in a margin account too, but it's going to help the people in an IRA even more. Now, what I have open right now is a margin account. So I'm not going to be able to show you what it would look like in an IRA, but the yeah. same principles are going to apply. So okay. let's go into, you know, let me just go into like MES, for example. So MES is a micro, you can see it right up there. MES is a micro E-mini S&P future. Yeah. And so this is, you know, this is a very, if you're, if you haven't traded futures before, MES or MNQ are going to be great ways to start because they're very, very small. Okay. MES feels like about 50 shares of S&P 500 stock. Wow. MNQ wow. feels like maybe 75 shares of S&P okay. 500 stock. So it's not a big position. Like it's something that you're not going to like, you know, wake up one day and like your portfolio is like blown to smithereens. Like that's not going to happen. So okay. this is a great way. This is a great way to start. But here's what's amazing about not even the futures themselves, not even the outright contracts, but the actual options on the futures, specifically for IRAs. So when you're when you're in an IRA, as all of your traders and all of your students know, the buying power efficiency is a big problem. Yeah. The buying power efficiency is a huge bottleneck when you want to do things that might be, you know, more undefined risk. I know you guys focus on a lot of butterflies, but from time to time, you might want to sell a put. You might want to sell a strangle, whatever. Right, well, right. if you're in an IRA, man, you're going to be fully margined on those positions. Right. And so it's like, man, if I want to go in to like SPY, let's say. So if I go into SPY and I go into, you know, the trade page and let's say I want to go to, I already have a position in August. So I'll just choose September just so it's kind of a clean slate. Let's yeah. say I want to go into September and I want to sell, you know, a 35 Delta put in SPY. So I go in, you've got the stock at 561. You've got the strike at 552. That's going to be my 35 Delta, right? This is a very standard position. We talk yeah. about this all the time on the network. So if people aren't familiar with the tasty live network. Hey, check it out. Check out my show. Check yeah. out all the other shows. We, I mean, we talk about this constantly. So you'll yeah. find a ton of content on this. If this is new for you, but let's say I go in here and I sell this, I click the bid, I sell it right now. Again, this is not an IRA, so it's not going to give you uh, the full representation of what this number would be for you. But you can see right now, this would be $10,000 for me. Now, this is only a $30,000 account, so that's way too big. I'm yeah. not going to do that in this account, right. but it's perfect to make the point that I want to make. That's a $10,000 buying power on what would be, you know, the notional value of a 100 share position in SPY, obviously at 560, it's about 56,000. Yeah. So that would be, if you're in an IRA and you go to sell this same position, and if your traders that are watching have their platforms open, do it right now. Go in, try to sell this same put. It's going to be 56000 in buying power. You're going to be margined all the way to zero because that's just the way that the regulators have, they, they're forcing us to do it. That's and so right. it's like, man, this is crazy. It has to be a cash secure put. All right, well, check this out. This is going to blow your mind if you've never seen this before. All right, so that's SPY. Let me go back into MES. So again, this is the same product. Now it's a futures product and SPY is spot. So there are some marginal differences. Don't get me wrong. But you have the same exposure to the S&P 500, the same exposure to the underlying index, essentially. Yeah. So we can effectively use them as substitutes. Again, you have to get the sizing right. This is 50 shares per contract, whereas S&P 500 is potentially 100 shares per contract. Yeah. So this is actually a smaller position. But let's say I go in to September same thing. I open up September and I'm looking for the 35 Delta. Now, obviously now I'm dealing with, you know, the full price of the index. So it's yeah. going to look a lot different in terms of the strikes. SPY is obviously one tenth of the index. And this is going to be the full price of the, of the index uh, for the September futures. If I go to the 35 Delta, the closest I have here is 34. So that would be 5575. Look what happens when I sell, when I sell this, uh, this same product. So if you notice, so let's talk about a couple of things. Number one, let's talk about the buying power. So look at the buying power differential between wow. MES and SPY. It's one-tenth. Now, again, I'm in a margin account. So you're probably thinking, all right, Jim, that's because you're in a margin account. It's not. This is where it gets crazy. If anybody has an IRA and they have it open right now, go in and sell this put. Your buying power is going to be less than $2,000. Wow. I think it's like maybe sixteen or eighteen hundred bucks. Wow. That's crazy, Dan. That's crazy. Yeah, now, I don't know yeah. why they let this happen. I don't know <laughs> if they just you know snuck one past the regulators. I don't know. 
<laughs> but man, just to now, this is not to go hog wild and lever up. I'm obviously we're not saying that at all. But it's yeah. like, man, if you want some undefined risk exposure, you go into MES, you get a ton of buying power relief that you could never get in the actual equity indexes like SPY and QQQ. Yeah. And so it's just it's great stuff, man. It's great Jim, stuff. And you, of course, the, how one more thing, just, Dan. One more thing. Oh yeah, just one ahead. more thing, real quick. When you're dealing with the futures options, I'm just scratching the surface, but I just wanted to highlight the buying power differential. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure we get to you know whatever questions might be out there. Another yeah. thing you have to be aware of is in futures options, there's always a multiplier that you have to know what it is. And it differs from one product to the next. In MES, this credit that you see, it's not like the credit that you would see in equity options. There's actually a multiplier. So this is 67 and a half points. And every point for MES is $5. So it's $5 per point. And the credit that you collect is 67 points. That's why when you see the max profit, that's actually in dollars. So you have to take the credit, multiply that by five, and that gets you to that number right up there. And so that's how you arrive at your maximum profit. And of course, your maximum loss would be if, you know, MES went to zero, which I don't know about you, but I'm not super concerned about it going to zero. Right, right. Uh, obviously, theoretically, it's possible, but practically, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that's helpful for people out there if they're not familiar with this and they, they didn't even know it was available. Yeah. Now, what would your max loss be on that? Oh, your max uh, like for Like for me personally? No, on that one, right, on this example here. Well, yeah, I mean the max. That's kind of what I what I mentioned. I mean the max loss is twenty seven thousand. Okay. Because it's it's all the way to zero, right? That oh, yeah, maximum right, right, loss right, right. is if the S and P five hundred goes to zero, which again, that's not a realistic maximum loss. It's just not. That's not going to happen, right? Now, you know what's a more realistic you know move? I don't know. It drops five percent. It drops ten percent. I mean, it's the same type of risk you have with any undefined risk position. Where, you know, I mean, you sell puts. I mean, selling puts is a great strategy in a market that wants to go higher. But you yeah. just have to be aware that you're going to get steamrolled from time to time. You know, like Jim, you said, I mean, you can you can take the risk off the front, but it's going on the back. It's the same type uh, of thing uh, here. Let's let's play the Uncle Guido part in, in, in Vegas when you when you lose more than when something's going against you and Uncle Guido says, Hey, put up the money or I break your ankles here. Give folk in a, in, in, just give them a little feel of how it is. Okay, you sell this put right now for 67, 75, whatever it is. And let's say over the next two days, we start going south. Give them a little, you know, from someone who's done this before, like yourself, how will the margin, how does it start increasing the role of Guido? Do they call you up? You know, how, how quick, does this margin, we started with a thousand, if we go down 5%, will the margin go to five? You know, a little bit of what to expect on this journey. What does what does Tasty look at in terms of when will, I'll call Scott, Scott Sheridan, Scott slash Guido, when will Scott call you up and say, hey, you need another five Gs in the account? You know, how yeah. will that work on this? Yeah, that's a great question. So a couple of thoughts, yes. So when you're looking at futures options, you're like, man, you know, uh, I'm just seeing nothing but gimmies, right? Yeah. Nothing but gimmies. And one thing I say on my show almost every single day is for every gimme, there's a gotcha. And so you look, <laughs> you're looking down the list and you're like, man, I just see nothing but gimmies. I see buying power relief. I see the same exposure. I see it's even smaller in size in terms of, you know, beta weighting the Delta to SPY. So where are the gotchas? Well, one of the gotchas is the buying power while starting off very low can and oftentimes will expand more rapidly than it would with an equity option. Now, hmm. how much more rapidly? Well, that depends on a lot of different things. But to give your community uh, some pretty clear reference points, I mean, the maximum that you could expect the buying power on a futures options position to expand would be five or six X. Now, that's hmm. like, that would be, you know, if we're talking like, you know, we're lock limit down, like things like that's a really, wow. really nasty scenario. So you're talking about going from a thousand to five or six thousand. You really? know, if you're in an IRA and it's seventeen hundred, you're going from seventeen hundred to maybe ten grand. But again, remember, if you did SPY, you're starting off at fifty six grand. That's so right. it's still it's still way better. And that's like worst case scenario. Generally speaking, I don't see it expand more than two to three x when things start to get a little hairy and a little bit dicey. Jim, you're looking would... at yeah, yeah. Go ahead. 
No, I, I was saying in this situation, why wouldn't you just for posterity's sake, if you're selling this put 55, 75, why wouldn't you for margin uh, to keep Guido at bay, why wouldn't you buy some put way out of the money, just some little put to uh, turn it into a wide put credit spread or something? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So like, for example, so you can see the buying power here is 68, you know, it's a thousand dollars and my credit is $68. Let's say I go all the way down to like, you know, I find like, you know, the three Delta, right? I mean, we're going like way down there. Yeah. Right. 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 Three Delta. And I buy this for $7. Yeah. So I turn this into a spread. So you can see, I do get a little bit of buying power relief, not a ton, right? not a ton. Right. And, and actually in your IRA, your buying power may actually go up. Because what's weird about the way that they they calculate buying power is oftentimes on a spread, they actually take capital away from the full width of the spread. So mm. if you're going, I mean, you can see right here, I'm 800, I'm 700 points wide or whatever. Yeah. They're going to take capital for the whole 700 points. Whereas the undefined risk kind of gets that baked in, you know, span margining relief. That's just kind of, it's weird. It's a weird regulatory rule. Yeah. And so A, number one, you typically don't get as much buying power relief as you would think. And also yeah. B, number two, over time, and the Tasty Research has looked at this quite a bit, man, that $7 you're paying, Dan, it it, yeah. it, it is a drag on the profitability of the strategy. And yeah. it's not oh, really yeah. helping you in the end anyway. And unless, now, if, if the market started going south quickly, um, but it, what was interesting, what you said is that if the market goes south, even though you had 27,000 of risk, the most that your your margin would go to or uh, buying power might be five or six, right? So it's not it's not really nailing you. Uh, too no, bad. and that's why. And that's why one other thing I want to say. I'm glad you brought that up because it it triggered that I forgot to mention this. This is why overall position sizing is so critical, and overall right. capital allocation is so critical. That's right. And so, like you know, at Tasty. Like we're mostly selling premium. We're mostly yeah. selling puts. We're selling strangles. We're doing things like that. You know, if you guys are mostly focused on butterflies, that's a very different discussion in terms of capital allocation and buying yeah. power. But yeah. speaking from the perspective of being a premium seller primarily, you know, typically, I mean, if you try to keep your undefined risk positions to 5% of your account, right, then you're going to have, if you're 5% per naked position and you don't typically go over 30, 35, 40% in overall allocation. Oh. You have a lot of cash on the sidelines for buying power expansions. Oh, now, yeah. And again, it's most of the time it's not going to happen, so it's not going to be an issue. But you want to make sure you're ready for the times that it does happen so you're not finding yourself just constantly having to liquidate positions early. That's a critical point. I, very, I mean, th that, that the sizing is everything. I mean, you can... Yeah, you can take the riskiest trade in the world, but if you're trading it at 5% of your capital or 3%, it's all relative. I mean, it's 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 not a big deal. Um, oh, Bill That's says, right. Jim, is that intraday margin? Yes, I believe, yes, it is. Now, the overnight margins do increase a little bit, but I don't, again, I don't think it's super uh, significant. And so you'd have to, you'd have to reach out to the, you know, support at Tasty Trade to get the actual numbers. But yes, this is, you know, these are intraday margins. And even in an IRA with the span, you get a little bit of intraday relief, if I'm not mistaken. And there is a bit of an increase overnight, but I, I don't think it's super significant. It's not like, it's not like you're putting up 1700, you know, for an MES uh, put in an IRA and Scott Sheridan and the boys are going to jack it up to 3200 overnight. Like, it's not like that. <laughs> All right. no. uh, let's see. Barbecue Trader said on toss. That trade naked put on MES is uh, buying power reduction eighteen thousand seven seventy. He said he's talking about an IRA. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm talking. That's crazy. Is anybody does anybody have Tasty Trade open? Because I would love yeah. to get a side by side comparison to not only show people the side by side comparison, but also give people a little shameless plug. To oh, maybe absolutely. move over from toss and maybe absolutely. check out a little tasty trade. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Bill, <laughs> Bill. Yeah. Uh, it should see. only be like 1700 bucks, I think, or maybe 1800 bucks is my oh, yeah. guess. Now, Joe said, Joe said, 
it's 1430 on TOS PM account, portfolio okay. margin. Sure, and yeah. He, and John says I'm showing, John says I'm showing 1490 for that contract. John, on what are you in Tasty or where are you at for MES on that one? Um, oh, TOS IRA account. Okay. Um, so different things. Um, Jim, let me, if anybody's got any questions, I'm just- a lot, a lot of TOS traders. So this is a good crowd for me to be talking well, to. Yeah, this that's is good. Told, this is good. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's what I, I mean, part of my thinking of getting uh, you here, besides I wanted to uh, meet you and, and, and go over, uh, get a chance to, you know, I, I've seen you a couple of times in there. I thought you'd be, you have great knowledge, great enthusiasm. I thought it'd be great for people to hear, but I thought also be good to see somebody actually using it in action, uh, the platform. Um and let me do a couple quick on the, um, uh, as far as the, I like that sniper shot for those uh, uh, out of the money uh, butterflies. And I think they're, they're very good. Have you ever messed around Jim with, okay, I'm at the end of the day. I think, you know, I think SPS in the next week will move. I definitely think it'll move the expected move. But I just don't know which way. And and did you ever do a double? What's your thoughts? And you ever do a double place place it? Sometimes we've done that at earnings. I mean, obviously you're giving up some, but sometimes at earnings, it's like, okay, which way do you think Apple's going? I don't know. Do you think it'll move the expected move? Yeah, I think it'll move the expected move. I don't know which way. Do you ever put a double on or any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a really great question. Uh, no, I almost never do that. In fact, I can't think of the last time I've done that. And the okay. reason why is just because when, when I'm thinking about what I'm trying to accomplish with expected move butterflies, and I'm thinking about the overall portfolio kind of writ large, the perspective I always take is, all right, this is very much an extra thing. This is very much you know, it's probably not going to move the needle either way a ton for a given month, quarter, year, et cetera. The thing that's going to be kind of the bread and butter that I keep coming back to is going to be the short premium. It is going yeah, to be sure. the time decay, you know, from, yeah. from day to day, week to week, month sure. to month. So that, so that being said, there have been so many times trading these expected move butterflies where you just, man, it's so difficult. Yeah. I mean, it's very difficult to get the move that I got in SPX today. Very difficult. Oh, sure, sure. As, you, as your community knows, right? Oh, and so good. I feel like over time, you're just going to run into too many scenarios where you're going to end up burning both sides. Yeah. Like you're going to end up like it's going to, it's just going to meander in the middle. It's yeah. not going to give you that expected move. That's and then right. you're going to end up burning both sides. So I don't love that. I don't love that because yeah. I think I'm just relying too much on a directional move. Whereas yeah. I would much prefer to rely on time decay. Well, and, and, and but but uh, on that move, the direct it's probably better because it is really going for the homer, right? Because if you're 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 not and and all you need is one of these out of X amount, right? Three or four, but you're going for the homer. I mean, you're going for three times it. One other question on the, I noticed as you were showing the expected move, I think you had 27 points and I looked at toss. I thought it was 32 points to Monday. How do you, a little bit, a little bit for folk out there, a, a rough tumble way. How do you, you know, is this, is the expected move? It's just standard deviation for three days, but what volatility are you using? Or maybe a little for people, tinkerers at home who want to, know how to calculate a three-day expected move. Uh, give some thoughts on that. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, the basic equation, the general equation for expected move kind of looks like this. So I'll go ahead and write it on the screen here. So expected move looks like this. You have the stock price times yeah. the implied volatility yeah. times the square root of whatever DTE you're looking at. Right. Divided by 365. So this is your right. basic expected move calculation. Right, this is right. your plain vanilla basic calculation. Sweet. Now, you know, Tasty Trade, I think, has a slightly different way of looking at the at the money options and the slightly out of the money options, almost like a Vic, almost like baking in a bit of a Vic style calculation for computing the yes. expected move. I actually don't know how they do it specifically. 
Yeah. Just because I've honestly, it's just laziness on my part. I've never taken the time to Me figure either. out like, you yeah. know, no, nah, just because I'm like, you know, I mean, it's difficult, Dan. And I mean, you know this too. I mean, yeah. just yeah. working with your students, it really is hard to figure out like, all right, theoretically, what is important and practically yeah. what is important. Absolutely. It's like, all right, I mean, we can go back and forth and we can start, you know, you know, picking apart the Black Souls model and this and that. But a lot of those things are just intellectual exercises yeah. that I don't know if it's going to help us a ton. I, so, like, I, for me, when I look at the expected move, it's like, all right, I know this is the basic equation. This yeah. is helpful because it tells me there's three components. There's a the yeah. stock, you know, there's volatility, and then there's time. That's it. That's all it is. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, is it going to really matter to me if it's 29 or 27 or whatever? Not really, because my strategy, I'm not trying to like, you know, take advantage of like really minor discrepancies in pricing sure. and like trying to arb these theoretical values. I don't have the resources. Yeah. None of hey, us do as retail traders. Jim, you, as, I tell, so, as I tell folk when I was in the pits, I'd have the guy next to me using a different model than me, the guy next to me on the other side using a different model than both of us. We'd all end up some of the same place. I always tell people, if you want to use Bajorklin or Black Shoals, yeah. whatever, just be consistent. It doesn't, you know, same as this, the fact that Think or Swim might have 32 points for the expected move Monday and Tasty has 27, it doesn't matter. It's about 30 points, right? Or whatever. Exactly. You know, it's, yeah, yeah to, to, you know, and I know sometimes engineers can get crazy and, you know, I want to know, I'm like, I never, in the pits, I don't know if there was one guy in our pits who... A, cared about that stuff because they just figured, you know, the guys who came up with the models are pretty smart. Just be consistent is the key. Oh, one question. Skid says, uh, Jim, how do you plan to manage your butterfly into the close today? Yeah, that's a great question. So I actually, uh, if I wasn't, so I have two butterflies. You know, let's make sure we, we talk about the good with the bad. So SPX <laughs> has been a, a big winner, but GC, you know, totally face planted on this one. Now this morning, I had a chance to actually take this off for a profit, but I just I wasn't able to do it because I just I just wasn't able to do it. I just wasn't at my terminal. But I was yeah. like, ah, when gold when gold was falling earlier and went yeah. under twenty four hundred, I you know this trade was in the green, but you know I got I got distracted. I couldn't do it, and that's just the way that it is. So this trade, you know, I'll probably try because I know the gold option pits. I think they close in maybe a couple hours. I'll probably I'll probably close this in when we get off of this zoom call actually. Yeah. And so I'll probably try to save my 80 cents or whatever they're going to give me right there with the SPX trade. You know, this is interesting because, you know, this is like, I mean, this is at least a double right now, maybe even a triple just using a baseball analogy. Yeah. So the question becomes, you know, do I hold it and, and try to really go for like, you know, you know, six rows back in, in the upper deck. I mean, it's possible. <laughs> I, I, I'd be lying if I said I haven't done it before and I won't do it again. Yeah. I'll probably end up taking this off pretty soon, though. Yeah. You know, one of the things about my show, for people that might not be familiar, is one of the unique things I try to do, and I take this very seriously, is I actually, for that show, I try to do all of my trading in that portfolio during the time that I'm live on the show. Yeah. So that way, people who follow on a regular basis you know, I want them to be rewarded with. It's a very continuous stream of thought. Like I'm not doing anything behind the scenes that you don't see. Like that can be really frustrating when you're trying to learn and understand. So yeah. whenever I can, I like to leave it on as long as I can. And this is maybe getting into that category. And so we might, I might leave it on, but I, you know, I can't really say normally though, like if I didn't have a show for, for this specific question, I, I would absolutely take it off. Now I would not leave it on. I would take it off. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do the same thing because sometimes you, it's such good learning when you're talking in front of people and saying, okay, here, I've got this. Now you look at this trade. I agree with you. I think, you know, 95, 90% of the time, because I would cry all weekend if this thing went against me now, if I lost, you know, I, I'd, cry <laughs> yeah. all, I'd go in a room, I'd tell my wife, this is a two, two day crying event. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do it. Now you could look at this Again, and th and th I think that's the answer, you know, to play with this. Sure, you could say, you know, could you? I mean, you only have one, so it's not like if you had two by four by two, you you know, sure you could take one off and let one run. Now with one, all you could really do is if you wanted because you're 25 wide, if you wanted to narrow it, but that that could be too much work. Narrow it to from 25 wide to 15 or 10. Yeah, lock in yeah. some money 
and then see if you can go for a bullseye and pull some more money, whether you want to do that kind of work or, or something, you know, is, is another thing, but you're kind of limited to what you do. But the bottom line is you tell us, you know, I would tell a student, if you lost most of this, we're taking away the option keys for two weeks and you're going to, <laughs> and you're going to stand right. in front of the class and, and you're going to tell the class what you did. <laughs> and there's no excuse. I mean, you know, yeah. it, because yeah. it, you're right. You don't, in reality, you don't hit that many where you bullseye it right like that, that close. But you're, it, it is interesting with, you know, you're talking 10, 11, what, four hours left? Uh, well, well, two hours. I, I would be waiting for my show. So two hours, basically. Oh, you're right. Two hours for your show. Yeah, yeah. So I've only got two hours to wait. And here's another interesting part of the story, right? I mean, so if we look at this, this is really, really fascinating to dissect. If you look at SPX, right, let's say it's, you know, 56, 36, just to use a round number. So I've got, you know, this thing is, you know, my, my, my strike is 56, 30, right? We're 25 points wide. Yeah. It's at 36. So that means right now, if it stays here, then I know that this mark price is going to increase from 11 to 19. Yeah, I'm only going to lose the six points that I'm away from the perfect price. So right. I essentially right now, I mean, I am, I am in the Catberg seat. Like right now I have all, I'm holding all the cards. <laughs> and so it's a really interesting spot to be in just because, you know, if it, you know, it could still, I mean, it could still go against me. By another eight points. And as long as it stays there, I'll be in the same spot that I'm in right now at market close today. But yeah, market, if yeah. it if it retreats a little bit, then I'm gonna be, you know, it's gonna you can see the market is increasing slightly now. It's gonna be 12, 13, 14, 15. So I don't know. Now I'm I don't know. I feel like I need to keep it on now, Dan, just for yeah. learning purposes. <laughs> <laughs> that way, if it doesn't work, I can just say, hey, look, here's the learning. Is we it all was, learn something. It was together. I like that. I do I do that. I do that. So <laughs> Well, good. J Jim, it's been a, a, a pleasure having you on here. And uh, uh, maybe sometime in the future, we'd love to get you uh, back in with something else. But th thanks for taking time with us today. Uh, good luck on the show today, folks. Uh, Definitely. Folks, I'd encourage you to, if uh, we don't have anything at two o'clock, so I, I'd encourage you to uh, uh, check out Jim yeah, what do what do they do? Just hit tastylive.com. Is that how they yeah. get it? Tastylive.com. The name of my show is From Theory to Practice. Uh, the best place to watch it though is actually on YouTube. Because oh, if you wow. watch it on YouTube, you can actually hop in the chat. And I try to interact with the chat as much as I can. So it's a really excuse me, it's a really fun experience to like, you know, everybody's together. I mean, there's there's, you know, a few hundred people watching the show. And so it's really cool. You know, you can find you guys obviously have an amazing community, but if you're looking yeah. for other like yeah, oh, yeah. traders that are trying to do what you're doing. It's a good spot to find them. So you go to, so you go on YouTube, you click tastylive.com. Yep. Go to the tasty live channel, YouTube channel, click yeah. on the live tab. Yeah. And I mean, all the shows are running all throughout the day. And then my show comes on at two o'clock. Okay. Cause those are interaction versus if you go to tasty live, obviously it's not interactive. Yep. That's right. Cause they can't that's right. do that. All right. Well, thanks so much, Jim. I appreciate it. What's the weather today? What, what, what are we Man, talking? it's, you know, it's a little chilly. I think it's like 87 or 88 today. So we you know got what? a little cold front coming through. <laughs> 87, geez. Yeah. So, all right. Thanks so much, Jim. Have a good awesome. day. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Dan. We'll talk Thank later. You. Okay. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye. All right.